Okay, so I think it's important to put this into context. So you're looking, the global market's worth about $1.8 trillion over the next decade. And of that, uh, about 340 to 360 billion dollars will be exported globally over the, over the coming decade. Now, where, does, where do the ver various countries sit within that? Well, Saudi Arabia is still the biggest country in terms of opportunities, and we believe that they will import around uh, 34 billion dollars over the next decade. Um, and this will prim primarily be in naval equipment. So they're coming through a big cyclical naval acquisition. And that could be around, about around half of it. So you're, lo you're looking at around uh, $16 billion worth of equipment. Um, after that, you have India. And India is, uh, despite rhetoric to the contrary, is still going to need to import large amounts of military equipment over the coming decade, probably around about $25 billion worth. And that will mainly be in military aviation and uh, subsea capabilities, so submarines and mission systems, so de defence electronics. Um, India still doesn't have the de domestic defence capability to be able to develop those and produce them within in the next decade. And then finally after that really, the, the, it's more of a region, the Middle East will continue to be the key region, about a third, so you're looking at over a hundred billion dollars over the next decade. And that will really be because you know, the Middle East continues, uh, the demographics continue to, to expand, uh, they haven't and they're not going to be able to build a domestic defence industry, and because the you know the disrupt the regional uh, turbulence in the region is, is it just isn't going to go away. So the, the two clear leaders there are Vietnam and Indonesia, um, both of whom are, well Vietnam is going to be importing around 10 billion over the next uh, dec I mean, next decade, whilst uh, Indonesia will be importing around 12 billion dollars. Um, now, what's interesting about both these countries is that they're moving away from traditional suppliers. So, in the case of Indonesia, they're moving away from, say, Russia or the West, and they've been looking at partnering with South Korea, which is interesting in itself. And Vietnam, which is, you know, has a, an inventory almost entirely made up of Russian sourced equipment, is now actively looking for partners in the West and um, has been looking to buy, say, you know, American maritime patrol aircraft, along with some of the other. Uh, very long list of requirements they have over the coming decade. Um, after that, you have Eastern Europe, uh, so, but also in basically anyone who has a border with Russia. So Norway, Poland, Romania, Ukraine, all the Baltics are all have increased their defence budgets uh, and are increasing their uh, the spend on future opportunities very, very dramatically. Uh, and that's going to continue to be a, a story that's going to run for a couple of years. And then you have a, a mix of other countries, the Philippines, although they're looking very erratic at the moment, they're, they keep they're with it under the new leadership. Uh, Angola has a large cyclical acquisition coming up for a range of different equipment. And then you have countries like Bahrain and Libya, which have plenty of potential, but again, political uh, instability might, uh, might, might, might curtail any uh, future opportunity. Well, You've, I think uh, you've got a number of countries which stand out, so uh, Venezuela, Greece and the UK, and these are all countries um, that are going to see a decline in, def in opportunity for uh, exporters because of self-inflicted economic damage. Um, you know, we've, we, we understand, you know, Greece, uh, Venezuela, we understand the UK more recently with Brexit, and this is going to have a long-term impact on defence spending. Um, so then you have countries like Russia and China. So China traditionally imported very large amounts of military equipment from primarily from Russia. Um, this is going to come to an end. They've got one last batch of Su-35 fighter aircraft coming through. And then after that, really, they're going to be developing equipment uh, and producing their own equipment uh, in, uh, internally because they now have the capability. The only one area where they'll continue to struggle really is, is, in, is in, in, in engines. And we continue to see China importing engines. Um, in terms of Russia, it's slightly different. Russian, Russian decline is for a variety of, of reasons. Firstly, the Russian defence budget is going to start going down after a long period of going up um, because, of, because of sanctions and various economic problems related to oil. Secondly, Russia has decided to become uh, uh, self-sufficient in defence procurement. It's no longer going to import from foreign companies. Um, but the, for the Russians, the other, of course, the other problem is the sanctions meant that they can't actually import when they need to import. And they do actually, contrary to what they, the, the rhetoric, they do need to continue to import, for example, uh, transmit or receive modules for fighter aircraft. Um, so, you know, they, that, so you're going to see a, a, a decline there. Um, you're also going to see a decline uh, in countries like Afghanistan, which have come to an end of a very large cyclical acquisition period. And now they're going to move into more of a support phase. Um, and maybe a country like Italy, 
where they have uh, you know, economic challenges and they've awarded a lot of their contracts for the longer term. They spread out their procurements over a longer term, so it means opportunities are, are lower as they spread out the, uh, as they spread out, spread out the spend. So the global defence export market continues to grow very rapidly, and it's been growing for at least a decade now. And it's a, it's reached this, you know, it's reached 67 billion dollars a year, and that's at a system level. So it could be much higher; it would be much higher at a subsystem level. And that's really being driven by aerospace requirements internationally. Um, you know, aerospace is very difficult to get into because of the high uh, R and D that's required to to develop a, an aircraft. And at the same time, we're also, whilst you know, we're seeing a sort of steady increase, we're actually seeing a lot of turbulence under the surface. So what we're seeing is traditional partnerships being eroded. So for example, India, key, key player, um, was almost entirely uh, importing from uh, Russia and France for, for many years. Now it's, you know, it, it actually, it's turned to the USA, and in fact, a couple of years ago, USA was uh, out, uh, outsold, uh, out, in fact, out-delivered. Uh, to India over, over Russia. And we've seen that again and say we're now seeing the same pattern now occurring in Vietnam. Um, we're also seeing new players emerge. So whilst the traditional players still dominate the market, um, what we are seeing is countries like South Korea and Turkey trying to break into that market by developing new products um, to capture some of that market share. Some of them haven't been quite su so successful. For example, Turkey has yet to really break through, but South Korea has been very successful with a range of different equipment into different markets.